Good morning, Valeria. It's a pleasure, you know, to, to meet with you today and to have you on the hotspot for the uh, Biomarine One Hour with. Uh, so um, we're going to spend some time um, with you to try to understand who you are, what you're doing, what are your expectations, and what the seaweed could bring uh, as an added value for the industry sectors. So let me start with the initial question that I usually uh, start with. Who are you, Valeria? And tell us more about your background. Yeah, well, thank you, Pierre, for having me here. Uh, I'm, I'm really happy to be, you know, sharing with you and by your marine audience, you know, uh, this discussion about seaweed. So who am I? Uh, well, to start with, I'm half French, half Colombian, and uh, I spent half of my life uh, in Colombia when I was growing up as a child totally amazed by the biodiversity, both, you know, in the forest, but also in the sea. And naturally, I wanted to study biology and, you know, to try to find solutions to overcome, you know, that the so many challenges we are facing to be able to uh, grow as a society that respects the environment and has a sustainable, a sustainable approach. So very quickly, I came to France to do studies uh, in biology and then by, in marine biology. And uh, very quickly, I figured out that in it, you know, trying to conserve nature was one thing, but it was not possible to do it without taking into account agriculture or you know, how, how we are feeding ourselves. And I remember very distinctly this, this moment when I started to look at algae. And I was suddenly passionate by algae. Uh, and very quickly, I understood that aquaculture and in particular seaweed and uh, algae aquaculture was one of the answers to you know, develop this sustainable approach for uh, food and feed. So, so yeah, that, that, that's me. Basically, I have a background in biology, a PhD on algae biorefinery. And now I'm working at SAMS, at the Scottish Marine Association um, for Marine Science in Scotland. And uh, the more I work with seaweeds, the more I open myself to, you know, this variety of opportunities and challenges that we still need to overcome. Okay, and then we we saw this um, with the at the beginning we saw your your video on the project that you're driving at SAMS. Maybe you can say an additional word on this very important project. Yeah, of course. So uh, the Global Sea We Star uh, project, which is funded by uh, the uh, UKRI, by the British government, it's it's it it really started with this, uh, you know, um, uh, this idea that uh, if you look at the seaweed industry and especially the seaweed industry in tropical waters. Uh, it is a it is a seaweed industry that was growing very very fast over over you know for the past thirty years, and uh, our scientists uh, were starting to notice that there is a lot uh, of crop loss due to diseases. So basically, you have an expanding industry uh, that has been providing new livelihood, new incomes to very poor uh, coastal communities across more than 40 countries. And after a few years, you start uh, observing diseases appearing. Ice ice or epiphytes, suddenly crops start to, <laughs> to crash. And, and no one's really understand what is going on. We, we haven't even identified really the disease or the epiphyte. We don't understand what is going on because it was growing so fast that no one uh, had the time to really think about it uh, just about biosecurity measures. Can you imagine what it is to take uh, an algae that is or uh, uh, with its origins in the Philippines and to start moving it around the world? It's great from the point of view that many, many families starting to have another income and cultivating the seaweed, but no one thought about the, uh, you know, uh, diseases or epiphytes that you were also carrying on. So our project is mainly about that, trying to understand what the diseases are what the epiphytes um, uh, that are, you know, causing these losses on the crops, where are they coming from? Are they triggered perhaps by changes in the environment? 
perhaps climate change, like we can observe in Tanzania, that waters are getting hotter and hotter. And so that's one point. The other is that we'd also notice that the genetic diversity was very poorly understood in the case of, of red seaweeds, like Apophycus and Eukuma. So not only we don't know what the diseases are, but we are not really sure about what we are cultivating. And if there is any uh, danger for wild stock and other native species. So that's the second point of the project, trying to understand uh, what is the state of the genetic diversity. And of course, if we want to have a sustainable approach and you know, a future in this industry, we should be looking at how can we provide new varieties to farmers? Varieties are resistant to diseases, uh, varieties are adapted to the local environment, so native varieties and not imported. Uh, and, and the other point is, uh, a very serious question that we have is, how sustainable this is really for farmers in the present you know, stage of, of the seaweed industry? Uh, it was growing so fast that they are lacking a lot of governmental structure and regulations about what are the best practices. So yeah, the project is not only about seaweed, but also about the people cultivating seaweed. I agree. And we have the framework for the question that are to come during the interview. So let me go back, you know, on the environmental part. So we understand that in, in tropical zone, there are two ways, you know, of cultivating seaweed, sexual reproduction, which is lacking, and also cloning. But um, most of the farmers, they're using the clonage uh, system to grow their seaweed, correct? Yes, it is exactly like with potatoes. So uh, it's very easy to cultivate uh, Eukuma or Capaphycus. Just need to cut a branch, attach it to a rope, and wait 45 days. So because you are just cutting and cutting and cutting again, it's what we call a, a, a monoclonal culture. It's exactly the same uh, ge ge genetic pool. And, and because you don't have this opportunity to have a sexual reproduction and have diverse, I mean, different genes mixing, then you cannot produce uh, um, you know, a next generation that could display um, traits that are perhaps resistant to a disease or maybe better performing uh, in, a, in a given environment. So because we are lacking this, uh, basically farmers are stuck with the same clone for the past 30 years, maybe a few of them, three to four perhaps, and, and, and they just can, they don't have any really um, coping strategy. They just can maybe move the farm for, from one area when they see disease to another one. But th there is no way for them to be improving the variety that they are conservating. And we are hearing always and always from the farmers that one of their main problems, beside the price instability, is how to access healthy seedlings. Yeah. And, and what about, you know, the support from the industry? Well, we have big names around and I don't want you know, to name them this today, but uh, are mm -hmm. they supporting, you know, the sexual reproduction, uh, I would say, R&D, or are they investing in this, you know, uh, species, you know, that could be uh, genetically uh, improved? Uh, what, what are the trends? Mm -hmm. So uh, what I understood from you know, the different companies we were talking about is that, of course, they, they know how the resource is in danger if we don't develop uh, an, an approach where you can breed varieties. Um, the re sexual reproduction of Capophycus is very complicated. And to my knowledge, there is very, very few labs that have managed to master it. And they're actually doing research on you know, producing new varieties starting to understand if they could be performing in the lab, if they can be performing in the shore after and all that. And we can name your friend Michael in the Philippines. Who yeah. Did an outstanding job, you know, on this part. Absolutely. So yeah, Michael Roleda in the Philippines is working on that. And of course, he's, he's receiving the interest of the industry because um, they, they know it's key for the, the sector to have uh, the production of seaweeds that are sustainable in terms of they can't, they, they are not going to be interfering with the wild stocks. That in terms of genetic diversity, they are not going to be washing out. And then suddenly, instead of finding, uh, you know, wild uh, native seaweeds, you always start to find the same clone all over. 
that's one thing and and the second is is also about you know providing this access to farmers as you know when it comes to plants to plant breeding and you know the development of, of new varieties there is always a mix of public and private in, you know investment so we are at the early stage of domestications. We are still relying on wild stocks. So if we are to be moving to a more domesticated crop, the question is how to do it in a way that you can uh, progress in innovation, but you can also ensure that the key players, like farmers, will have access to this innovation. Yeah. Um... Let's continue, you know, on the environmental part. I think that it's important to explain that there is a continuity between agriculture and sea agriculture. And what's happening in the sea uh, depends, you know, and reflects on what's happening on the land. And most of, you know, the issue we have with South Asian seaweed is the pollution and the heavy metal and the pesticide and even, you know, the, uh, well, the uh, estrogen that we find, you know, in the wastewater. So how do you think we can deal with this, um, I would say, wrong side of the uh, environmental part to improve you know, the quality of seaweed? And should we concentrate on area uh, that have no um, contamination? How can we deal, you know, and how we can help you know, the farmers to grow organic seaweed instead of, you know, this, uh, um, I would say this not so good, you know, seaweed that we yeah. find on the market. So, well, I think that um, you, you need to have an holistic approach, approach, correct? It's, it's about matching the good side with the good cultivation technique. It also depends on what you intend to do with the seaweeds, because seaweeds uh, are a great, have a great potential for nutrient uptake and uh, they are known to, to be, you know, algae in general, to, to be good bioremediators. And so they could be uh, key to remove the pollution. But then, of course, you cannot insert that, uh, you know, in uh, products, in food products or, you know, for, for, for human consumption or whatever. You could still, you know, use that for maybe bioplastics or biostimulants, biofertilizers. So that's one optic. They can be used, you know, maybe to mitigate the pollution. But when it comes to seaweeds for human consumption, that's where you need to select sites that are, you know, free from this pollution, but at the same time that uh, have enough nutrients, natural, you know, present nutrients. Um, they, they don't require that much nutrients. So that's a, a very important advantage compared to land crops, mm. is that they don't need that much to, to grow. Uh, so for me, it's really how you match, you know, site selection with cultivation techniques in order to not only produce a healthy, you know, crop, uh, but also in a way that it doesn't impact the environment. Okay. Um, I know that it's one of the uh, cruised, we, we, you and, and me and many of our friends are, you know, uh, conducting, uh, it's, you know, the social uh, corporate responsibilities and the social aspect of the seaweed industry. Uh, we all know that mostly it's a, it's a job that is done by women around the world, especially in the tropical areas. It's very important for the local communities. It participates, you know, to the improvement of the local life. Uh, you've been experiencing this with your many projects. How do you see the future of this seaweed industry and how can we help the local communities and the women that are involved in improving this business? Um, it, it's, it's a question with many answers, Pierre. Um, well, the, the, the first thing is um, I, um, the government support is really key here. Um, when the seaweed cultivation started, you know, it expanded very quickly and it was a, a very, very good opportunity for many, many um, families in, in, in the coastal areas. If you take the example of Tanzania, uh, it was a great opportunity for women uh, because women don't, don't swim in Tanzania, correct? So while husbands were, you know, busy with fishing and, 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 other, and other resources from the sea, 
uh, for women, it was really a great opportunity to just be able to cultivate something in the shore. They don't need to swim. They just can go there when, um, when there is a low tide. Uh, but then what we can see now is that uh, because the government really didn't pay attention to what was going on with this sector, they are lacking of uh, training, capacity building about what could be best practices, uh, how, how maybe to better manage the farm when you have a disease outbreak, what to do, how to react, should you change your ropes, should you, you know, uh, find a way to, to um, uh, you know, maybe take, the, take them out on the sun or rinse it with fresh water to try to try to avoid disease uh, spreading uh, between one cycle and the other. Uh, so uh, for me, there's a, a key role in establishing, you know, uh, adequate policies, training, uh, a lot of capacity building when it comes to uh, biosecurity, to better, you know, farming practices. And uh, that, that's one point. Um, the other is that um, I think it's very important for the market to be more diversified. If you take the example of tropical red seaweeds, they are produced for carrageenan. And carrageenan is now a commodity. It's used as you know, um, gelling, uh, thickener agent in the food industry. We, we have carrageenan in many, many of our daily products. And I think that if we could think about other products that have a higher value, it could bring you know, uh, more income to those families. It could be, bring more income to those communities and will uh, help the government to understand that actually it's good. I mean, it's, it's key to have the right support in place. In Tanzania, they have cooperatives, you know. Farmers have organized themselves, but uh, they don't feel that the government is provided enough support. Okay. To and, go well, for the next step, yeah. I think that uh, within the biomarine community, we have some great example of high value compounds that we can extract from the seaweed. And it's gonna be uh, presented on, on June 17 at the occasion of our global event. But I think that we need to raise awareness uh, and, and make sure that uh, the farmers, they get you know, and they preserve a decent revenue from what they're doing because it's the yeah. most essential brick you know, for the future of this industry. If we're missing, you know, the farmer's step, then we're missing the entire point. And we don't want, you know, to the seaweed industry to become a commodity market. That's very important. Yeah. Uh, let, let, me, let me go back to an important also driver mm -hmm. for the future of the seaweed industry. We're talking about carbon offsetting and there is a speculation around carbon offsetting. Uh, at Biomarine, we, we want to spin off a project in terms of carbon reduction. We're not claiming, you know, the, the blue funds, but we want, you know, the companies to improve carbon reduction by investing in seaweed. And you know that uh, Ocean 2050 with Alexandra Custo and Carlos Duarte, they are working on this formulation to be certified to assess, you know, the carbon reduction. But from your point of view, is it important uh, to use seaweed for carbon reduction and to what extent? We have some numbers, but maybe you can come back you know, to uh, what, what is said today about uh, the seaweed potential from the brown and from the red seaweed and what will be you know, the deal in terms of investing in seaweed for the future generation. Yeah, well, um... So yeah, I mean, seaweed, seaweed will contribute to carbon reduction because they will be capturing carbon. Uh, uh, part of it will you know, go to the ocean carbon pool and be sequestrated, but the majority you know, uh, will be only sequestrated if you are producing a product that have a, a life length that you know, is sufficient to really start talking about uh, you know, sequestration. But, Yes, for me, seaweeds are, are, are part of the answer on how to reduce you know, carbon, how to capture this carbon. And the most important part for me is that you can um, replace with seaweed products, you can replace you know, um, products that have a higher carbon footprint. So for me, that's the key that seaweed are really an answer when it comes to produce uh, low carbon footprint uh, products. So, 
And even beyond that, if you are talking about carbon capture, because it's all about climate change, climate change goes beyond carbon, correct? Yeah. It is, it is about also, you know, nutrient mm -hmm. uptake in waters that, you know, uh, have a lot of eutrophization. It's uh, about uh, producing healthy, healthy food. It's about, as I was saying, replacing products from, um, uh, made from petroleum um, today with something else. Uh, and for me, that's something, it's something that really needs to see, to be seen as a package. It has the potential to improve livelihood, uh, for many, many families, it is reducing and capturing carbon and is replacing nasty products with, you know, better products today. So that's where, you know, you have this holistic approach. It's not only about calculating exactly how much carbon you are capturing with the photosynthesis and how much is going to the ocean carbon pool and how much is, you know, re remaining in the chain. It's really about how you use seaweed. So this is important and the message we're going to send to the industry is yes talk to us and invest you know in seaweed farm it's going to help you know local population it's going to help to reduce carbon in the atmosphere and participate you know to the climate change fight yeah okay perfect and just to say another last comment about that i think that because it's an emerging sector we have the opportunity to bring around the table all the key players on this you know it's it's uh the industry, scientists, the communities, government, we are just at the start. And the investors. And investors. We are just at the start. So I think that, you know, with the, 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 the right place to be discussing all these uh, opportunities and the challenges also, because we need to do it in a, in a smart way, uh, I think it's just, you know, an excellent moment. And, and we should take this opportunity to bring everyone around the table. Valeria, uh, let's talk about the next generations. Uh, how can we convince the next generation to get more, I'd say, involved in seaweed and, and to learn more about you know, the benefit of seaweed in, in their day-to-day -day lives, but also participate you know, to this project? How can we mobilize them? Um, I think it... You, um, you know, products are already in the market. They are already, um, you know, the people that are buying these products are already the ones that are convinced that, you know, it's important to have a healthy uh, diet and that we'll be looking at alternative products and all that. But then you have all the rest that are not maybe, you know, so, so not so aware, but they are not really, um, you know, looking at, you know, how to improve uh, their food, their carbon footprint or how to move to more healthier food. However, with children, I think that we have an opportunity and for me, it should come from, you know, the very, very young ones and, and introduce to them products from seaweeds. Uh, at a very, very early stage. My, my son is totally fan of uh, nori snacks. Sushi is not that easy, uh, but you know, uh, just nori snacks, he, he loves that. He, he, he loves that. So, so now for him, it's not, it's, uh, at the beginning when I was telling him, hey, this is seaweed, or you know, preparing a soup with, with, uh, with seaweed that I was foraging on the shore, he really didn't buy it at all. <laughs> But nori snacks worked very well. And now he's like, okay, yeah, seaweed is, is, is a bit like, you know, the, the lettuce we have in the garden. So when you start with that, and that seaweed is not something exotic anymore, but something that you can go and, you know, forage, that you can see, you know, in the shore and that you can buy at, you know, the supermarket uh, as a snack, that, that for me is a way to start. It's about being clever on how you market. You can claim all the health benefits you want. If people, uh, if, if, if the consumers are not looking for that, they will not pay much attention to that. But start with the kids. That for me is, you know, not only snacks, of course, but about, you know, explaining, you know, how seaweeds can save, that can contribute to save the world. And, and so for the adults, what will be the best recipe you can prepare with seaweed? Oh, uh, uh, there are so many, there are so many. Like, you know, uh, I think that uh, one of the best um, dishes with seaweed uh, uh, I had the opportunity to, to taste was in the Philippines. 
in the Philippines. It was a fresh salad with calerpa and capaficus and other, other veggies. It was really, really delicious. It was so fresh, so crunchy. It, it, was, it was awesome. So I will have that for starter. Uh, and then you can have maybe, I don't know, a hamburger that, you know, could be a vegan hamburger made yeah, you know, with seaweeds, but you can also add a bit of palmaria palmata, those, mm -hmm. or also known as the, as the seaweed that tastes like bacon on top of it. You could also make risotto with, you know, uh, uh, sea lettuce, the ulva, uh, nori as well. Um, there is also the sea spaghetti in Mentalia. That's a good way to reach kids. Uh, there are so many, so many wonderful, you know, things to do with, uh, with seaweeds. And that's something that is, uh, it's, it's awesome to see that, you know, in Southeast Asia, uh, some countries just, you know, eat that as another veggie. Correct, yeah. And they are used to it. Uh, while in Europe at the moment, we are still, you know, uh, talking more about gourmet cuisine to try to, you know, uh, bring this to the adults. Mm -hmm. Snack for kids, gourmet cuisine for adults. That's the way it's going at the moment. Excellent. I, I like spending time with you because it's refreshing and uh, you bring a new perspective, you know, on the seaweed industry. And uh, so what will be the next step for you in the months to come? What are your projects? Uh, well, at the moment we are, uh, you know, on the Global Sea We Start project, we are reaching the end, right? So we are very excited about all the results we are going to publish. But uh, beyond that, uh, we are going to be releasing four international policy briefs. So one international policy brief that uh, we hope is going to, you know, uh, reach um, uh, governments, also investor and, you know, people from the private sector about our recommendations on what uh, is a sustainable approach for seaweed industry. And we are going to have one policy brief, one, one per country. And, and then, well, uh, we will see next. There is so many, so many things to do with seaweeds. Uh, I'm, I really would like to dig more on what, what could be uh, the permaculture principle, mm -hmm. you know, apply to seaweed, what, you know, uh, you could do if you want to have a more extensive approach. Uh, again, I think that, you know, it's a case by case basis, correct? In some places you want to have a farm, in some places per perhaps you want only to have a very healthy kelp forest and you are you know, uh, uh, harvesting from time to time. In others, you could be doing a, a land-based system for you know, uh, very picky seaweeds that don't like to be cultivated at the sea. Um, there is so many things to do. This is excellent. That was a very nice, uh exchange. Uh, I'm really excited about the potential and you can count on Biomary Network and support by all means, you know, what you're doing. And I look forward to welcoming you back on the 17th of June. Thank yes, you. yes. Thank you Absolutely. so much, Valeria. And uh, enjoy your day, your sunny day in, in Scotland. And let's, let's get back in touch very soon. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you, Pierre. I'll see you all on the 17th of June. Thank you. <laughs> Bye.